Hi, I'm Carol Reeb, and this is Doc on Monterey Bay. Each year in winter, many of us plan a journey home. Some of us will fly, others might walk, but if you're a Carmel River steelhead trout, you've got to swim, and that could be a problem. It's late summer, and steelhead trout are somewhere off the California coast, feeding in the vast Pacific Ocean. But as winter approaches, adults will gather here in Carmel Bay. When the time is right, they will attempt a remarkable and dangerous journey back to the small creeks and streams where they were born. There they will reproduce. This is the place where the Carmel River flows into the sea. But if a fish in the ocean wanted to get to the river right now, it would literally have to march right up the sandy beach to the lagoon above. And that's not possible. So how can a fish bridge this gap? Over the thousands of years steelhead have occupied the Carmel River, its way of life has changed or evolved. During the summer, it's normal for this river to disconnect from the sea. Thus, steelhead developed a great sense of timing. They wait for the winter, when storms flood the lagoon and water streams down the beach to meet the high surf. This bridges the gap, and that's when fish make their move. This video shows an adult steelhead trout reaching the fish ladder at San Clemente Dam after swimming 18 and a half miles upstream. Now, let me take you on a journey to Garza's Creek, where steelhead trout are born. We'll discover challenges that shape the evolutionary history of these migratory fish, making them the unique population they are today. We'll encounter new threats as well. Some may be too much for a fish to overcome. This is their river road home. Steelhead trout are anadromous fish, which means they are born in freshwater, mature in saltwater, then swim back into freshwater to breed. The salinity transitions are physiologically stressful. This lagoon, with its brackish or mild salt concentration, offers a great place for fish to rest and slowly adjust. Somewhere in this tangle of cattails is a channel. The adults must find it and follow it out into the river. We are just below the Highway 1 bridge, less than a mile inland. You can hear cars passing overhead. One of the things this river does not have is a steady flow of water, especially in summer. Here we see flow in the lower river has been reduced to a shallow stream. In bad years, this section of the river can run dry for miles. We continue on noting water flow is sporadic, past Portero and Robinson Canyon creeks, where trout are known to spawn. Now the flow increases. In Garland Park, near River Mile 9, the river comes alive. In Garland Park, there is a large bridge with a water gauge that records daily river flow. The Water District regularly updates this graph, which shows good water years and bad. In 2007, California began a three-year drought and water levels dramatically dropped. Since 2010, the rains have returned. What about the future? If you come to this bridge each year, you can look on the graph to find out. Beyond Garland Park, the river slows. We are now approaching the exit for Garza's Creek. Trout will swim around those distant reeds, past the willows, and come toward us. As they do, a few will know to turn. Salmonid fish chemically imprint on their natal streams. The taste and smells of the water in Garza's Creek guides them home. As we turn around, the creek will now come into view. If you are a fisheries biologist, this dry creek bed will give you pause. Garza's Creek is a spawning area. It's also a nursery for young trout hatched in the spring. This time of year, young fish should be making their way downriver. Instead, their way is blocked. A three-year drought, coupled with the absence of summer rain, will lower an aquifer's water table. Pumping water from wells like this in times like these can drive a creek underground. Well, let's follow our field assistant onward. 
Maybe we'll find water on our march further up Garza's Creek. It's been about a half mile and water has reappeared. Let's listen to the sounds. These baby trout are three to four inches long and were born in the spring of 2010. They blend with the creek bottom, making them hard to see. If you can hear the birds in the background, you'll understand why. Some birds eat fish, so nature has allowed steelhead to evolve camouflage to hide their young. Steelhead have survived in this river for thousands of generations. Thus, they've had time to adapt to its harsh conditions. These fish here are being exposed to direct sunlight, warm temperatures, and low oxygen that would kill the average trout, especially those from more northern rivers. Yet these guys are alive. Out of curiosity, I return later to check on the fish in this pool. Unfortunately, you can see the water is drying, and the clock is ticking. This fish appears to be one of the last survivors. Cut off from the river below, all I can do is wait for the rain. There is a bridge with a horseshoe nailed to it, where the water drips quietly between boulders. Above this point, we are unable to find any more fish. But below the bridge is a beautiful pool, deep and shaded. And here, we have reason for hope. You've got to look close, just above the white rock. There's a trout at least three times the size of the others we've seen. This fish found the coolest, deepest pool on Garces Creek and survived. Nature has given it something the others never had, luck. Given all we've seen, luck is probably the biggest key to survival on this river. Now, let's retrace our steps. Sit back and listen while we fly over the route we just walked. Look for golf courses, a winery, several farms, and condos. This is the modern world of the Carmel River's steelhead trout. We made it back to Garza's Creek. We're home. And that was 14 miles by river. It's a Sunday afternoon, December 19th, 2010. I'm standing here on a sandy beach where the Carmel River flows into the sea. Well, actually, the river's not yet connected to the ocean, but it's really close, about 40 yards away. As the winter rains begin, water levels rise in the lagoon. To prevent flooding of nearby homes, bulldozers carve a channel through the sand, encouraging the river to reconnect with the ocean. You can't see them, but steelhead are here, just beyond the surf, waiting. For many, this will be their first time home in three to four years. A few will have done this before. But for most fish, this year's march up the river will be their last. This graph shows the annual returns of fish to San Clemente Dam since 1962. Superimposed are years of drought, along with strong El Niños, which bring heavy rain. We see three patterns. In the 60s, steelhead returns varied greatly. From the mid-70s to 1989, fish counts were not recorded except in 1984. 
During this time, drought and a growing population of people began to impact water flow. From 87 to 90, no fish reached the dam because the river did not flow to the sea. The 1990s brought better river management and a lot more rain. But while numbers increased at first, trout migration to the San Clemente Dam has not returned to previous levels, despite protection under the Endangered Species Act. Carmel's steelhead trout evolved in a river with low intermittent flow. They modified their way of life and adapted to change. But no fish can survive without water at all. Today, it's rainy. Will tomorrow's rain be enough to keep this species alive? of the trout. I don't know how they make it up this river. <laughs>